steps in the door out of the way guaranteed right here all you have to have is two hours dedicated tomorrow i know it's last minute uh, i messaged him last week but this is obviously you guys only have class once a week so if you happen to be available tomorrow from four to six then i'm going to pass this around write down afterwards write down your name and email i'll get in touch with you and basically we have to do an expedited application process so you're going to have to send me your resume i'm going to have to forward that to my manager she's going to go ahead and put you through for tomorrow's meet and greet and then you're going to have to do an application before tomorrow as well but we're going to expedite it we're going to get you in and you're going to be able to go to this meet and greet um, from four to six and then basically you're going to get a five minute interview with one of our managers there as well so it's going to be really quick it's on the ball but Hey, just like how some of our opportunities are, you only have 30 seconds to make a decision. So if you think that this is something that you just want an option to, just to look at, then get, you know, write your name down, I'll take a look at your resumes, and I'll, I'll be sure to forward the information to you. So a little bit about how's um, a new way to design your home. I looked at this page for eight hours of my day, all day. Uh, luckily, it's a good looking website. Um, it was founded in 2009 by a couple named Adit Sarko and Alon Cohen. Uh, they were kind of redesigning their house, and they realized that everything sucked. Like they had, they only had uh, magazines, and they were going in between, you know, uh, certain home professionals to to get things done. And so they created this website, and it's basically a place to stream for photos and get inspiration, find professionals in your local area, and shop for things that are in all those photos. So it's a great website. We're getting about 40 million unique monthly users, um, and we're expanding worldwide. We just opened offices in France, Tokyo. Uh, Madrid, Denmark, Australia, so a lot of opportunity here, and it's growing fast. This is probably one of the biggest offices, the biggest growing offices in San Diego. So if you want to be a part of that, if you want to be part of, I wouldn't say it's a startup, but a growing business that has a lot of room to, to grow with, and you like money, then I say, you know, join, you know, try, try and jump on this opportunity. Um, it has unlimited potential for bonuses and commissions for, you know, however, however well you perform is what you're going to get at the end of the day. Um, and then if you like the possibility of, you know, being at the top of a, a business at the end of the day, then, you know, this is where you can grow. So if you want to write this down, a little of the information is tomorrow it's from four to six. Um, what it's going to be is they're going to tell you a lot more about the house, company, and culture than I did right now. They're going to tell you about the position, which is an account coordinator, which is what I do. And it's basically, um, I call professionals and I get them to just sign up on the site. I'm not even selling them anything and I'm making commissions and bonuses. All I'm getting is like if I was Mark Zuckerberg and I was calling people and I was like, I've got this awesome site. It's called Facebook. Do you want to sign up? That's literally what I'm doing. So it's easy. If you're if you're likable, if you can talk, if you can creatively think about situations and you know pivot around it and really kind of because everyone thinks that you're selling something. And if you can get around that and really you know be personal with them, and get to the point that I'm not selling anything. You're going to do well. So that's basically the position. They'll give you a lot more details there. Um, and then afterwards, after that five-minute interview, there's going to be a social hour of drinks and food, opportunities to network. So you know, even if you don't end up finding a career path there, you might meet someone at the social that you know is in the same position and could lead to an opportunity down the road. Um, and you know, that's about it. It's going to be at our office, which is downtown. It's at the Diamond View Tower. I don't know if you know where that is. But it basically looks into Petco Park. So every time I have lunch, I can watch the Petco game. I can watch the Padre game. It's pretty awesome. They dedicated the best corner of the office to our whole fully stocked kitchen 24-7 because they care a lot about employee happiness. So if you're looking for somewhere that cares about employee happiness, um, this is the place for you. And some of the, our other perks are um, there's, a, there's a gym down at the bottom, fit, you get discounts there. Um, there's uh, bonuses, uh, you get full benefits off the bat, you know, dental, vision, everything, um, company retreats. I mean, I think I've pretty much said everything I can about it, but I've been for a little over a month now, and I'm already finding new perks, new opportunities down the road. I mean, today, um, we just had our quarterly annual meeting, and our CEO, I got to have a one-on-one -on -one with her, and then I got to uh, talk to her as she was presenting the quarterly meeting. There's 900 employees. In this business and i got to sit and talk to the ceo one-on-one -on -one for 15 minutes and we didn't even talk about business we literally i asked her what she wanted to be when she was growing up and she said she wanted to be a fairy to like <laughs> go to like bad cities and make them good and you know make sad people happy like this is the conversation i was having with our ceo so it's very laid back this is how i dress to work today they call it snappy casual i discovered it when i started there but it's like 
if you look good and you look hip, then mm -hmm. no worries. You don't have to be wearing a blazer and a tie every single day. You know, I'm pretty much half of what everyone's wearing in here would fly at, at my job. So, you know, great, great place to work. Um, I would show you more about the site, but I feel like I've already taken up, you know, a few minutes of your time. So go to it, house.com, if you want to learn more. There's a whole <coughs> career tab, and you can read all about it. Um, and then before I pass this around, does anyone have any questions? And I'll be free to happy to answer any of them. Questions? Questions? I have a question. Yeah. Well, so basically the idea with house is just like a platform uh, joining like donors and like people wanting to design homes. Yep. Yeah, so really quick. Mm -hmm. And this is what I talk about all day, every day. So this is the photo stream. This is where a lot of people might discover us. This is where homeowners might scroll through. They can kind of narrow it down to their, their room style of what they want. They can save these photos to their idea books and basically collaborate these idea books with their already decided professionals. And that way it kind of just uh, takes out a middle step of like, I think I want this, but I'm not sure. I don't know how it'll look. We have approaching 11 million photos in our photo stream. They're all great quality photos, and they're all given by homeowners, by business professionals. So that's a great tool that just kind of allows uh, collaboration and uh, allows a better <coughs> visual idea of what they're going to do. But I mean, what the, the the main idea of what my job is is connecting those professionals. So I click Find Pros. It already geolocates our location based on our IP address, and there's 35,000 home improvement professionals in a 50 mile radius of where we are right now. That's a lot. I had no idea that there would be that many home improvement professionals in this area. So basically what I'm doing is I'm calling places like Chinook, New York, or like, uh, I don't know, Detroit, or tiny little cities all over the, the nation, and, I'm, and even parts of Canada, and I'm calling these professionals who are you know struggling day to day to succeed in their, their small business, and I'm just offering them a free listing in our professional directory, and then I offer them about 10 minutes of my time to guide them through the process, and you can see here, these all have great quality photos, great business descriptions, tons of good reviews, and I tell them how they can get that. So it's not like I'm just throwing them out onto the site and then they're like, what am I doing? I don't know how to like make a good profile. Um, we lay it all on the line for them and we help them build them, and then they always have our number where they're an account coordinator. So if they ever need help, they call us, and that's pretty much what it is. It's all free for them, 100% too. So, I mean, our job is literally just helping people. So, like, how does uh, your company make money? Is it, are you charging information on the like, We have national advertising with big box stores like IKEA, uh, Pier One, uh, okay. stuff like that. We also have uh, a marketplace, the shop, where we sell a lot of products, just about anything you can ever imagine about the home. We sell okay. a lot of products there. And then we do have a local advertising program where certain professionals choose to participate in it, but it's by no means necessary. You can notice here, it's kind of fuzzy. This one is sponsored. And this one is not, and this one is not. So it literally just throws one up there. There's an algorithm for the area. Throws one up there. I mean, it's not anything like Google Ads or like Facebook Pay. It's not going to be in your face local advertising. <laughs> but that's just one of the smaller ways we make our revenue. It's primarily through the national advertising and, and the marketplace. Okay. Any other questions? Was there one over here? I did. Is this position solely commission based? No. no. So it's hourly. Um, which I guess I could tell you. I don't think it's confidential information, but it's it's good. Like if I don't meet my goals, it's not like I don't make my hourly because I know certain certain places are like that. So I'm always making my hourly, and let me tell you, significantly above minimum, minimum wage. And then if I do meet my goals, which is 90% of people that work there do meet their goals, I get a pretty hefty bonus. And then if I exceed those goals, I get even more. And I mean, the potential I can, there's so many, so many things that I can do more than just meeting my goals to make a lot more money than I thought I was going to straight out of college. So, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Did you I just want to know how the company, what, how old is your company or this company? And then how did you, well, I don't know if you know the inside scoop, but how did you so quickly to 900 uh, employees? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, we started in 2009. <laughs> And like I said, it was a couple in Palo Alto, and they were just remodeling their house. And then after they, um, they basically, Alon Cohen, he had worked for Google. He basically made this site back then for them. And then they kind of told friends about it, and they told friends, and they told friends, and they ended up spreading, and then they realized they needed you know, an infrastructure to hold all this traffic. And it literally spread all by word of mouth. And then they realized the Palo Alto office is now all engineering, because I mean, Go through this website. It is a flossy website. 
Um, it's all, the Palo Alto is all engineering and all editorial. We have a significant, on the right, it's a stories and advice. We have a significant editorial team that's pretty much trying to replace a lot of like uh, the home improvement magazines and things like that. You know, where professionals and customers can meet to talk about issues that they're having with their, their patients. Um, and so that's all that. And then they realized we need some more people here and there. And then they, I don't know, they just, it, it, it grew. Um, from 2009, it grew by a steady 33% three, rate every single year. So we're at 40 million uh, annual or monthly users right now. And before that, we were at, last year in March, we were at like, what's 33% less than that? Like 30, 31 million or 28 million or something, and then 33%. So if you look at the metric, we're just boom, boom, ever since since the beginning. And it was all, it was all word of mouth. I mean, we don't pay for any, I mean, a lot of you guys don't know what this is, and that's because we don't pay for marketing. It, we, we rely on good word of mouth. So it's a very holistic company. Um, it's organically grown. It has potential for you to take your career by the balls and succeed. So that's something you're interested in. I'll go and pass this around. And if you know, if you have any questions, um, I want to hand this off to Katie. If you have any questions, feel free to email me them as well. And like I said, it's a very expedited process. So if you want, and you're interested, then we're going to do this quickly. But so uh, just. Make sure that you're very interested and you're very uh, driven to succeed because that's how every single day is going to be like on the job. So that's about it. Thank you guys. All right. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there's one perspective, right? Uh, it's another company that is doing something in the marketplace that is different. Um, one of the other perspectives. Um, that I thought uh, we do is uh, I share the uh, perspective from Tria. All right, right. So, um, so uh, I shared with you before. I, I uh, mentor up in the Sound Innovation Center. Um, so I work with Ryan on the uh, about uh, Trio. Uh, Trio is an app that's about wide sharing. Uh, and um, the reason I invited the guys down is because um, they're about six months ahead of where you are today. Uh, so I'm going to let them share their insight from where they were, and one of their classes, how this came together. And uh, you know, as you're looking at uh, what you've done as groups here, right? a lot of you come together with really good ideas, right? something that has the potential. I see um, a number of you are uh, kind of juggling as a team. And I, I, I'd like to encourage you to continue doing that. But I also think to that end that it would help if you saw somebody who is doing what, you're, what would come next for you. Right, so uh, please uh, uh, welcome uh, Trio and uh, uh, So first of all, thanks to KP for letting me and Ryan, Ryan will be here later, <coughs> come in and speak to you guys. Um, is your sound or? Uh, yeah, I'll keep going here with this. So just real uh, quickly to give you guys a background, we are a long distance ride share app that emphasizes social experiences. So imagine you want to go down to Santa Monica for the weekend looking for a ride. Um, just want to, I guess, you don't have a car of your own, you can pretty much run on the app or jump on the app and look and see who's posted a ride. So we're taking the ride share experience, the social uh, Facebook groups where people are posting, it's really difficult to find a ride, and we're moving all that to our app. And I could speak here and talk a lot about it, but I'd love to show you guys a video about Trio. Just real quick, I may cut it off a little bit, uh, but this will give you a good idea of what we do. Here we go, the long ago, when you walk on the sidewalk. In the sand, remember, all we did was care for each other.
Let me cut the video off because I don't want to take too much time. But that's not awesome at all. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. So, ladies, guys, this is this is uh, all this that you see and where we are is only as KP said six months away from where you guys are. Uh, so what I did was I applied to the Zan Innovation. Uh, they call it the Zip now, Zan Innovation Platform, where I just had this idea of ride share. It actually roots to when I came to California. I'm a grad student, didn't have a car. I wanted to go to a Lakers game. And I was like, I'm not riding the train three hours to watch a Lakers game. Like, I love the Lakers, but I didn't have uh, a way, a mode of transportation, and I wanted to do something social. And boom, that's where Trio came to my head. And uh, I applied to the design innovation platform, and I got in in January. Um, and one of the things they've been teaching us, and probably stuff you've been learning here, is to go straight to the customer, to understand what's going on in their head. So the, la the last three, four months, that's what we've been doing. Um, we don't have the app on the App Store yet, but before that, our prototype was actually testing Facebook groups and going on and asking people, do you take rides uh, from here to LA? And then actually giving rides <laughs> from here to LA. So taking a practical standpoint and listening to what the customer said, what was important for them, uh, and then implementing that. Um, so that's all really I have to say. I'm sure there's questions, but yeah. How long ago was this founded? Because I swear I heard this idea like two years ago. Uh, the, thing, the reason you heard this idea is because RightShare is not new. RightShare is not new at all. Uh, the way we differentiate is the social experience. This is why I love to show the video because it's not just about just traveling. It's about the experience of traveling and finding similar-minded uh, individuals, people who are college, are college uh, students as well, or maybe they're into sports. They want to travel to a, a venue concert or something. That's what we're doing that's different than the competition. Was there a similar uh, right share app before like recently that was going on? I, I, I just heard it in the time. Yeah, there's, there, honestly, guys, there's a lot of competition. There, to me, it's not competition, but it's there's a lot of people in the same space. And we know this year is a really big year for right share. We see a lot of people on the same college uh, right share groups that we created that we're a part of. All these right share companies are starting to pop up. And we're like, where does that guy? I thought we got here first. So. It's going to be a very competitive scene this year, but we're also excited because we know something's brewing, something special is about to go down, and we're going to be the first to be there. I just want to let you know that in Europe, we have something like that, and it's so, like, it's so big now that I'm sure, like, on the road. Yeah, Blablacar. Yeah, Blablacar. Yeah. And yeah. so, and I, like, I was looking for something like that in the U.S., and it was so That's what they keep telling me! Oh, yeah. Boom! Yeah. 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 I know, I know. Well, because they yes. are so well in Europe. That yeah. Everyone uses it yeah. in Europe. And yeah. we're. That's a problem. Like, like, I think like, you should really get people to use it. Like, yeah. Because a lot of people are. Are traveling, but yeah, they don't fine. they don't go to the the sh the right share website like the right. They don't think about that. Yeah. It's not um, I don't know normal for them. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're really excited about the international community in San Diego mm -hmm. because we know that's going to be rides all day once we set this up. Yeah. You guys are going to be <laughs> requesting, so we're really, really excited about that side of the market for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then is, this, is it like if you have the app and you have a car, is it just completely social or is it saying like you can ride in my car for five bucks? No, this is, we have that emphasis of social, but if you're looking for a ride to uh, LAX, you're traveling, we also implemented the app. So we brought in both sides. That's another thing that differentiates us. A lot of people are just doing like, oh, I just need a ride, you know, but we're doing both. We're implementing both sides. So. Any other questions? And I, if you don't mind me, interjecting, no, I'm going to pass down a sign-up sheet for the beta version, which we'll have hopefully by tomorrow. So you guys will be one of the first to touch Trio and work with Trio. How, I can't curse, I can curse. How fucking excited are you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you can't be cursing, so we're good. <laughs> Well, thank you guys for your time. Thank, thank you, KP. I appreciate you. <clears throat> What's up with like everybody on this side, man? I feel like I'm like this today. Is there is that is that is that like nobody want to be on the camera this time? Like I did, I can make the camera. Go. There you go. Everybody's on. There you go. No pressure at all. All right. So who's ready to do this? Yeah. Any questions before we get started? Yes. Can you go first? <laughs> no. Yes. Yes, you may. 
Right? You don't ask me who's yet. Are there any other questions? Uh, do you think uh, MC today? Because it's, it's not active. Thank you for reminding me. It's been a very heavy technology today. Thanks, um, Steve. Actually, uh, check. I thought I sent it beforehand. <laughs> Yeah, it should be. If you, you know what? 703, it was off. Yeah. Well, I can't create another one because it said it's still open. Um, no? Just not showing up? Um, did anybody, was able, anybody able to check in? I just did. Yeah. There we go. Just, just did. Yeah, so it's still saying you got 10 minutes left. Yeah. Okay. Now, there's uh, a couple components for tonight I want to go over. Right, so um, so yes, we will be live streaming this again. Yes, I shared it on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. Uh, I tagged SDSU, SDSU College of Business Design, a couple other things to try and get people to watch your presentations. Right? Uh, the other part is that um, uh, there's going to be uh, three judges. One, two, and three. So um, the third score is going to come back from everybody who isn't in your group that's watching your presentation. Right, so know that your scores will be from a professor's perspective, it'll be a student entrepreneur's perspective, and also from your colleagues. So um, that's where your scores will come from. So know that you'll get uh, your evaluation represented on a number of different facets. Now, I do want to uh, uh, acknowledge that I understand that, uh, that, that there's a grade associated with your work. That's how a lot of this evaluation will, will translate into, right? Uh, you will get evaluated by a, a group that will translate into points, which will translate into a grade. Um, and, uh, uh, and I understand the importance of that. Definitely do. I want you to look at uh, other things that this will mean also, right? This is an evaluation. This is going to tell you how well you're doing at these five different facets of this presentation. But so remember when we looked at this very early on in our creative profiles, right? We looked at things were looked at how we deal with evaluation about different types of ideas, this is that part, right? So yes, the grades are important, but I also want you to take the bigger and the longer term perspective is what are you learning out of this? What skills will you have? What will you be able to do when you leave here, right? And when you look at a presentation and a project through the same lens, right, the same rubric that we're doing here, I think that you will be better prepared for success in the future, right? So that being said, uh, we will get started. You guys can start getting set up. Right, so the way this will work is uh, you'll get up, you'll get set up for your presentation. Uh, we'll throw the camera on you. Uh, we'll all watch the presentation. And again, we'll be using the rubric that I shared in advance. Um, uh, uh, we'll be using for scores. And then uh, when the presentation is done uh, on course key, you'll get served up five questions. You'll get to put a score in between 1 and 20 on each of the five sections. So each of you will get to vote. And then uh, I'll take the average of the numbers from the students, and that's how that score will get added. Does that sound fair? Okay. Uh, any other questions on our presentation? Yes, you may go second. Are there any other questions? Yes. yes. We're going to go third. I love the proactive attitude. It's all this. I will tell you that uh, uh, from the last class, we had uh, we had eight great presentations. Everybody looked like they had fun. Uh, everybody did. Everybody did much better in the group than most likely like some initial reactions for what they did for individuals. So please have fun. Uh, let's see your great work. And please enjoy yourself. Right? Uh, the hard part's over. Right? You've done all the work on the presentation, on the memo, and everything. Come up here, work with your group, show us what you've done, and we'll have fun tonight. Sound fun? Yes, um, after the presentation is over, I'll send those out in five questions, and then you'll be able to evaluate um, the, on a five questions between 1 and 20. Right? You can tell me where the school is, okay? Um, I into, like, sports. Okay, um, is anybody else have a problem getting in course key on? Work on the best story. Best story. 
And for our design thinking, we want to find out what are some products that could help us to solve sexual assault. And most of these products on here are some sort of weapons. The problem with a lot of these is it gets you in too close. And if you're in too close, you're screwed. <laughs> you're screwed. So we, we use our, our thinking, we found all these products. Also, a lot of them with weapons, most people who use weapons are properly trained. Police officers and army. Most people who need them for sexual assault are college-age girls. College-age girls are not trained at all to use weapons. So we thought of mace, because most girls already own mace, but they don't use it because it's stuck in their backpack or somewhere else. We thought of bracelets because James Bond is pretty cool, and James Bond uses his bracelet. It's very mobile and good for this kind of stuff. So we, none of us are professional artists, but we try to do a little bit of our, what we would design the product like. Um, and then each of them we have a bracelet, one has more of a poster at the top. Um, for this one, there's a thin tube of pepper spray in the middle of it. And then on this one, Ryan likes gold chains. So he did a gold chain with pepper spray. When we were working on a two button system, we need to find an engineer to help us make this reality. So, um, we came up with the name, the Alamanda, which means it's the Alamanda is this flower. It's a blonde flower, it's fragile. But the trick to this flower is it's poisonous. So we're coming up with a beautiful bracelet that spits out its poison. Yeah, as far as target market, um, so about the victims, 80% of the people are under 30 years old. This kind of just proves that our target market's in the right place. We're trying to hit that college age women who are anywhere between about 19 and 23, approximately that age. So that kind of just proves our point. Uh, the numbers, one out of every four college women have been sexually assaulted. Uh, once you think about that, one out of every four women in this room has a chance of being sexually assaulted, according to statistics, and that's pretty mind-blowing. Uh, and the MACE numbers. MACE is a really real big industry, and it's continuing to grow. So we know that people are buying the MACE. That's not the problem, but the problem's not being solved. So what we plan to do is the MACE numbers are going to continue to grow up, um, and not, we actually want to solve this problem. Okay, so we've got a, we've got a video here. It's on us to stop sexual assault. To get in the way before it happens. To get a friend home safe. And to not blame the victim. It's on us to look out for each other. To not, not look the other way. It's on us to stand up. To step in. To take responsibility. It's on us, all of us, to stop sexual assault. Learn how and take the pledge. And it's on us 
So this movement is really famous and it's a good way to try to decrease the number the number of assholes, but it's not enough. And we need we need more product to help us to escape in that like if something happened. And so it's on us to help companies like us to that want to make a change. So we created this product. It's in the working right now, but the thing is, is we can't do this alone. And we need all of you, and we're all in this together. Any questions? Thank you very much. All right, now if you please go to course key, and uh, we're going to evaluate. Okay. All right, and uh, that should be available for you. So, uh, organization. What do you guys think? Right, so he's going to I know, I know, that's what I love him. I love him, though, man. There you go, man. That's it. I know. Hey. Yeah, we're just putting a number or yeah, between uh between yeah, one to twenty, right? You get for each of those questions, right? That's remember it's a one to twenty score, so you get to pick where they would be in that scale. Okay, and again it's the same rubric as it's got posted, so that's your guideline. <coughs> So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, i tracking. Uh, yeah. So we Hey, I got it. Can you make it active? Let me finish this. Yeah. Uh, innovation. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I didn't do any of that, so it's a big thing. Right in the market, it's actually really something else. Are you awake? I'm sorry. Yeah, right. That's the one. Yeah, like, this is the market. Yeah, this is the market. Okay. 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 Okay.
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's all right, because it's all these things for balance, right? And it's like you have to do, right? It's, uh, that's why I think it's better to have this guy. Mm -hmm. And then you can move on to the next one. Okay. We'll get you there. All right, you boys are changing. Yeah, now I can make it, but it's not actually right. So I'll have to go back and pick it up. So go into like assessment. I really did that one. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, we're going to close out uh, our evaluations. Got from there, and uh, ready for our next group. Are you guys ready? Okay. Uh, we'll get you across too many cables. You're live. Done. And you're uh, so live. Good evening, class. My name is Brian Playhive. I'm accompanied by the lovely Anna Flores and the dashing German Florian Dressen. Uh, we decided <laughs> to pursue the Dickin Park uh, park sharing economy that connects drivers with homeowners in crowded areas. We actually decided to test the alpha version of Pick and Park before class giving some sushi in PB. Damn, I'm so hungry. I wish we can go get something to eat before class. Yeah, I know. But sushi place, PB, should get some sushi, guys. I'm down it. You crazy. It's going to take us forever to find parking in PB. Trizzy, didn't you download the Pick and Park app? Yeah, sure, man. I got Pick and Park premium. What but, is Pick and Park? You know, like, Hey, You know, hey, I have class later, but one more here, right? I got in the land, the 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 in the Pretty close the scans, in the list in the so being San Diego residents, we've all been in that position searching tirelessly for parking. Uh, the idea first came to me this past winter in San Diego trying to find parking in PB. Over 30 minutes trying to find parking, we finally settled for a place about a mile and a half from our final destination. I'm like, man, there has to be a better way. So then I'm walking and I see all these open driveway spaces. I'm like, these need to be utilized. So uh, we created the pick and park idea. Uh, such as the Eureka Hunt, we talked about having that aha moment. Um, so then we formed our group, decided to get a large scale of feedback via an online survey, and we got 140 respondents. This was valuable information. As we figured out, people spend a pretty good amount of time trying to find parking. They share emotions of anger when finding parking. And also, they stay in these parking spots for long hours at a time, generating some good revenue for Pick and Park. And 82% said they would utilize an application such as ours. Um, so although we eliminated some ideas in the evaluation process, we were able to get some other valuable feedback that we um, included that Anna will talk about. Yes, this is right. We were able to accumulate a lot of good ideas for our application through focus groups and also brainstorming between each other, one of the thoughts we decided to incorporate in our application was establishing different parking options of the car and the size of the parking space. That way we can avoid conflicts of having a too big of a truck in a tiny parking space somewhere in PB. Another idea we decided to implement was establishing a rating system for the host and the guests, that way they can rate each other, and also coming up with two-way communication system Again, between two parties in case they need to get a hold of each other for whatever reason. Going further, we also develop different payment options for our application, such as instant payment or instant park and pay park. With instant park, you can choose your location, pay and park instantly. With pending park, um, the host has to confirm your parking spot. It might be necessary, so we decided to include that. And uh, our final concept that we decided to use for our application is reaching out to people and getting traction through social media. In order for us to do that, we decided to create social media accounts such as Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. That will increase our exposure to the market, as well as um, we can get feedback from our customers. We can also use it as form of advertising. We're further going to go to the market potential. In the end of our presentation, we want to take a look at market potential to show you that all ideas definitely going to work. 
Therefore, we took a look at the two statistics. At first, we took a look at the number of private and commercial motor vehicles registered in the U.S. We got the numbers from 2014. And as we can see, California would need about 14 million automobiles. That's an extremely large amount of automobiles in the state. Like on, on the next thing, it, it's getting more, even more significant that the projection of 2020, there's like 10 or $3 billion in the market. So there's definitely money in the market of the parking industry. We did some projections. We have projection to have in the end of our first year over 100 driveways connected with our app, then it generating over $200,000 uh, of revenue in our first year. So thank you for your time, and together we can revolutionize the parking industry in Southern California, and eventually, the world. There's nothing like some fresh fish to get the creative juices flowing before taking these class. Mr. Matty couldn't make it. I shot him a message on Facebook. He was like, there's no way we're going to get class in time. Apparently not. But hey, we're over here. That's a good luck. Cheers, brother. <laughs> very nice, fellas. Yeah, very nice, fellas. Uh, let's, okay. Yeah, I know. It's a little, little controversial, but sorry. Yeah. I'm sure about All right, please do your evaluations. Next group can get ready after they're done. Get started. Yeah, right. So organized. So the twenty. I'm thinking about the organization. So we're. Where you feeling? We had a lot of data, and then back to the app, and it flowed pretty well. I do 18. Yeah, I'm going to go over there. I thought they did a good, right, design thinking. I thought they did a good job on taking up the different steps, right, and ideation and evaluation. Total story. Some change. What are you feeling about that one? You lean on this one. I thought they did very good. Built for design thinking? I mean, the phrase, I think it's in the process of a lot of yeah, right. Like, a good point, right? Okay. So I thought that they like I love that survey that they right. I thought that tells me that they, they try to understand a lot, right? From the in in the label <laughs> and explain. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, didn't say based on that. Right. We didn't pivot. Or we do any of the other stuff. Right. So. Yeah. Okay. Right. Create some new right in the idea. The idea itself. What do you think of the idea? I've heard of it before. Yeah. Yeah. I did a project. I did the same thing. So. Everybody thinks this. Yeah. I know. That's where. That's why this one's the top. They're like. You had even played that, um, right? So they they can do research and they know how they have to see what else is in there. So is it a good? Did this? It's good. Or is it very or low? Very good or high good? I give it a high good. Yeah, I did thirteen or Okay, I'm good. Right? Innovation. Did they demonstrate innovation? Again, it's been it's been done, right? You feel on like fourteen, so thirteen, fourteen. Yeah. I'm going to Yeah, I'm going to Yeah, right. 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 I mean, they may have been inflated. Those are huge. Thank you. All right, wrap up your evaluations, please. Whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. 
my name is Rose, this is Noah and Guille, and we are presenting on surfboard packaging. Uh, first of all, things we're going to cover today uh, is a video of Noah packaging a surfboard, the problem, the issue, the matter, and then followed by our design thinking, solution, and the value proposition, and how there's a huge market potential for this. Do it have any of you ever received the surfboard before packaged? Package. I need mean, you receive. <laughs> do, do any of you know like how they package these surfboards or like what's the time mm -hmm. that they take to package them? All right, well we'll show you uh, in the next video. <laughs> seconds of edited video. Um, as you can see, I had to use a lot of different kinds of material, bubble wrap, shrink wrap tape, a lot of packaging foam, and unfortunately most of this material is not recyclable, and most of it will end up in or, uh, or dumpster. So that led us to design thinking. We just thought there's got to be a better process of packing surfboards. So we, what we did is we went out and we talked to people within the surf industry and people outside the surf industry and we tried to gather as much information as we could about the design thinking process and uh, moving on to the next slide is this is a kind of a similar idea that we want to try to accomplish is uh, sliding a surfboard into a plastic sleeve where you'd be able to inflate air around the surfboard and the benefit with this is you'd be able to pack your surfboard in seconds versus uh, you know 30 minutes or longer to, to package your surfboard and you know we hope to innovate this solution with uh, maybe an aftermarket type of idea where you can like slide this inflatable plastic sleeve into an existing board bag. People who want to go on a surf trip travel, they'll be able to protect their surfboard a little bit better. So our value proposition on our on your right, you can see our customer, and the job they have to get done is package your surfboard and ship them out, right? And the what they get get from doing that is sales and revenues and all of that it's their business so with the things that come with that it's high cost that they pay for the materials that they use to package their their things however with our new packaging process uh it, which is reliable and easy to use they just package as Rose, Rose showed you uh it's less time less money that they have to spend in it and it's very convenient and it's they can replace their existing ways with this one right away, no cost at all. And going to our next one, which is our market potential. So there's an estimate of 400,000 servers being made a year worldwide. And if we put it down to here in San Diego, we use two local um, packaging distributors for servers. <coughs> so there's two main ones, and then they, they roughly sell about 49, 200 boxes a year just here in San Diego to package surfboards. So we will, what we will be replacing is the material they use to wrap the surfboard. And if we do our pricing, what we will sell that for, times the boxes they sell, it gives us 541 a year. And then if we get to our potential market, which is a 400 ones that are made a year, it gives us a 4 million revenue a year. So pretty much it, any questions? Yeah. Very good. All right. We'll let you take the video. I know all about this. <laughs> we just we just sit here and let you do it. All right, please do your evaluations. Uh, 
see a Google Hangout and mm -hmm. it's on uh, Facebook a lot. We do a lot of videos with Mark from uh, a lot of Mark PFT from the Yeah, it's on Yeah, it's on All right, so uh, let's see. Are you recorded as well? Yeah. Yeah, that way we can all read it back afterwards because everybody like doing the presentation that they are. I'm just watching all this. Yeah, 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 I'm just watching all this. Organization, Innovation. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry, this is design, design thinking, right? So I think they did a good job. Right? Like, they're working still like the happy hour. Right, so it's not a good thing. Right, good. Creativity, so creativity and concept. Hey, Correct. Yeah, yeah. So I think they missed the emphasis. So I think they did where the so innovation. Imitation concept. I think it's very, it's very beautiful. <laughs> 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 All right, please wrap up your evaluations. Twenty-three thousand people watching. There you go. Woo! No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I've had it. Stage is yours. All right. Good evening, Charts. My name is Ben Musetti. I'm Rachel. Miles Merritt. And we are the creators of Pop Up Chef. What we're seeking is a $100,000 loan or 20% of our company. And we're going to go into the details of what Pop Up Chef is exactly. So, what it is is an app, smartphone app, which allows restaurants with available space to connect with chefs who are trying to showcase their skills or trying to get their name out into the market. Because most restaurants only operate either for dinner or they might do breakfast or lunch. So, there's a period in the day where they have nothing going on, they're just wasting the space they have. The app also allows foodies to connect with the restaurants as well to experience a unique culinary uh, experience. And without further ado, I'll just let the video show you guys what it's all about. Hey, do you wish you could get your name out in the restaurant world without actually owning a restaurant? 
introducing Pop Up Chef. It's a generally understood idea that when restaurants are closed, they make no money. Pop Up Chef gives restaurant owners to rent out their restaurants during the closed hours to chefs who would like to get recognition in the restaurant world. Let's take a closer look at the app. Here at the home screen, you can click on Chef to see the current list of chefs who are selling reservations. You can click on Restaurant, where chefs can see the current restaurants that are open for rent, or Foodie, a new social area where food lovers can talk about their experiences at the pop-up restaurants. Clicking on Chef, you can see a quick bio of the chefs. You can see the reservation times, the menu available, and the date the chef is opening up their pop-up restaurant. Here's a closer look at restaurant. You can search for a venue by location and by date. For example, you can see in Los Angeles, Tasting Kitchen is available for $400 a night. In conclusion, Pop-Up Chef is a new collaborative way for restaurant owners to make more money, a way for chefs to receive much needed recognition and most importantly, a way for you, the foodie, to try out new culinary experiences. Pop-Up Chef is a new, fantastic idea. All right, so moving on. So chefs, you might be wondering, how did we use Design Think to come up with our idea? We use Design Think, we use design think to develop our app through the whole process. So first, we wanted to identify a problem within um, the restaurant industry. So we to interview some restaurant owners to see what their main problem is with generating more revenue. And most, what we came to the conclusion is, is that restaurant owners have a problem with generating more revenue that doesn't involve opening a new restaurant. So they need a new way to make more money without actually having to invest a ton of money to open a new restaurant. And secondly, we decided to interview chefs. We wanted to empathize with them and see what they needed. And what we concluded is that chefs, especially sous chefs, um, are kind of under, they don't have creative reign in a restaurant and they want, they need a place to express their creativity and show, showcase their skills and get their name out there um, in the industry. So Pop-Up Chef addresses both of these issues. Um, chefs can, a restaurant, because foodies can come in and explore their food and restaurant owners can make extra money by basically doing nothing, just having to list their restaurant on their app. Okay, so why do you guys want to invest? Here's the market potential. So, the pop-up industry in the United States is worth $50 billion as it's standing. It's growing 10% annually, and the current restaurant portion of that pop-up industry is only 23%. So what does that mean for everyone here? Sharks, lady sharks, guy sharks. It means that there's a huge opportunity for growth. So, what this app does, it allows restaurants to carve out a larger market share inside the, uh, the pop-up industry. And how does it do that? It's being a vessel to facilitate restaurants to chefs and then chefs to people. All right. And then once we start generating some profits, we'll also be giving at least 20% to uh, Father Joe's Villages, giving back to uh, homeless and needy, helping feed them, clothe them, and all that. So, just in conclusion, a couple takeaway points from this is that we stand to be the first mover in a huge market with plenty of potential, maybe upwards of 100% to grab the market share because there's no other app, nobody else is doing this, making this sort of connection. We also stand to uh, help all the chefs and restaurants maximize uh, use of their space and their time, and we stand to help give back to uh, the community in the end. So from us, that's uh, Pop-Up Chef, and uh, who's ready to work with us? There you go. How much? No deal. <laughs> Are you guys playing with boards? Are you guys playing with boards? I have no idea, but I don't know. Just based yeah. on the feedback, I might. All right. <laughs> All right, please do your evaluation. All right, guys. Oh, man, come on, do the thing. Hey, hey what up? Get the camera. Get yeah. the camera. Get off of there. All right. Yeah. All right.
Do you ever run errands without wearing makeup? One in three women admit that they refuse to leave the house without makeup on. The amount of time you spend in the day varies based on which of the weekends. The average morning routine for Monday is about 17 to 18 minutes, but by Friday it drops down to just 19 minutes. The amount of time you spend getting ready varies based on which day of the week it is. The average morning routine for Monday, for example, is about 76 minutes. Out of 33 brands tested, about 60% of lipsticks were found to contain lead. Note, however, that such a minuscule amount of lead makes it a amount that it's nothing to worry about. Only 4% of women around the world have lead. Believe it or not, this is a double increase from just 2% in 2004. Also, 80% of women agree that every woman has something about her that is beautiful, but do not see their own beauty. Uh, what we've seen here, the struggle is real. So we have a couple of problems which we try to solve. It takes lots of time and effort to put on the lipstick, to make it look good, to take care of it throughout the day, and it tends to smudge all over your face. So um, our product is basically the solution for that. And as seen, the camouflage lipstick uh, is very easy to apply. Um, it's always ready to use, reliable, and very convenient. So we have we have so many. Over here. We have so many different colors and products uh, which you can use for different occasions and daytimes, etc. Um, and we made one of them. So uh, we made all of them into one. So, like this. Um, so, so, we have a couple of pictures to uh, show the, uh, how it works throughout the day. Um, so, in the morning, you can save your time and have a longer breakfast, for example. Okay. Um, and you don't have to worry about how you look at work. You uh, do the gorsum, I guess. <laughs> and you can save some time there. And you can really enjoy your night out um, because you deserve it after a long, <coughs> um, worrying day at work, but you don't have to worry about what you're doing. So. Yeah, now um, she's going to tell you something about it. Mark, okay, um, through the picture that you can see that we have a, a couple of portraits about that from 2014 to 20, uh, 2020. So for the first graph here, you can see the uh, potential, the market potential it grew up really quick and then it's a huge market though. And in the future that, of course, women, they would love to use it, right? And then uh, also, more and more men, they start using makeup now. So I believe this is a bigger, that, I mean, the, the huge amount of potential with that part too. And um, also, like, um, um, what we expect is that um, to, uh, by 2020, we will like, expect it to reach like the, um, 390 billion in this uh, market. And because like, from 2014, a lot of uh, people, they are starting changing their lifestyle. They're looking for more of the natural, organic products um, for their health. And the market here, it's uh, getting bigger and bigger, and then it's influencing the, um, the GDP of all the countries around the world. And also from the top uh, graph, you can see there's a, uh, it's a one type of, uh, one type of the market is of 53.7 billion. Um, which was a uh, takeover by the color, color, cosmetic, <laughs> and uh, also you can see from from the regions uh, size says uh, the Asian, North America, and the Western Europe is the biggest market in the world so far. And thank you for listening, and thank you for your attention. If you have any question, please feel free to ask. Uh -huh. Very good. Thank you.
Are there any questions? All right. I'm going to please go and do your evaluations. Right now, they went into the camera. You know, it's not shared by country. But they say, no, if we can get this percentage, this is up in time. I was thinking next time, man, we should record the audio so they could hear like.
Alright, please wrap up the last of your evaluations. Right, while you guys are setting up on the last hit. So what are y'all learning from this that you've seen everybody else do at this time? Any any great revelations, any aha moments so far? <laughs> any other great observations? <laughs> Yeah. Passion, passion to a product that they sells it really well. Kind of leads through. You see somebody. Anything else? Uh, some legit ideas. Yeah. 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 Right. See, that's one of the reasons that I like I wanted to turn down here, right? You see, this is what comes next. Uh, it's a little too late for like having. Uh, um, and Kyle from uh, Zombie come down and do this. Yeah, but yeah, I'll this share this time. Where I think it is, is I think it's an opportunity for you to see what comes next for these guys. And just as a reminder, the Don is up there. If you want to move forward this as a group and do something with it, the resources are here. So I get to do up, go upstairs and say, hey, you know, I got an idea I want to talk about. It. So there's different cycles that we come in. Um, so just want to make sure that you, you realize all that stuff is there. This is what comes next. And I obviously encourage you all that you want to pursue this, you know, um, the people that are ready to help that, okay? All right, the kayak sub. Yep. So who's ever wanted to ride in a submarine before? Yeah. See, well, our product's going to make this possible. So part of our design thinking process when we first got started is maybe we thought about editing scuba gear, but then we quickly realized that not everyone has the ability to go scuba diving or to even go into a submarine, um, whether it be physical or financial. It's either really expensive to buy or rent out a submarine, or some people don't possess the lung capacity to actually go diving. And so we decided we wanted to target the average family, you know, two parents, two kids, middle class. And so we started making a checklist for things that we wanted, things we didn't want. And um, as we started knocking things off and putting things on the checklist, we came up with four primary ideas, and um, the first ones were the car, jet ski, and kayak, and shark submarine. And we liked all four of these, they all had potential, but we had to continuously narrow it down. So we listed more of the pros of these and <laughs> narrowed down to the two we were most passionate about, the shark submarine and the kayak submarine. And then from there, we continued to list the pros and came up with the kayak submarine. Primarily for two reasons, it was less expensive because we didn't have to make it look like a shark in the water and didn't have to swim like one, and um, it was less expensive in the fact that we didn't have to change the paint job or anything. And then moving forward to the prototype, we still had to keep in mind the user's needs and what came with that. So now here's a quick video of our product. Now you can see he's pulling down the hatch here. He's uh, starting to descend, goes in the water. I mean, same principles as scuba, got an air tank in there. He has this fishtail rotor on here. We're going to address that later because we're going to make a much better solution to this. Now you see the bubbles escaping right there. That's release pressure so that you don't crack underwater like an egg, basically. So now we get to this. I mean, that was pretty awesome, right? It was like James Bond meets 20,000 leagues under the sea. I mean, like, you can't get better than that. And now it's like we came up with our own concept of this, which is maybe even better. I mean, like, we turned this garage like experiment into something that could get actually manufactured and like, brought to the consumer. Now we made our own prototype here, and we realized right off the bat it needed to be bigger. We needed to be able to make it not just one person, we needed to make it three persons. So we ended up making it 24 feet long. We made it wide too, so it's very comfortable for the consumer on the inside. And then we made it so you're cruising along, you'd be kayaking, and then you'll put on the hatch, you keep it there. And you put on the hatch, it slides on. So if you do get caught underwater, if you need to escape, instead of pushing against, you'd be pulling the hatch out so you can escape very easily. So you pop on the hatch, you get ready. Water fills a compartment in the front. Same concept as any submergible. You're able to dive down. Now another innovation we made on this is we added a rudder right here, which makes for better maneuverability underwater. 
and we added a propeller on the back. Propeller makes it so you can chop through kelp and you won't get caught in it like the fishtail system, which was a flaw of theirs. And now move on. We also made our um, <coughs> kayak submarine eco friendly by making it a bike powered with electric and motor assist, which uh, move on. It's easily to incorporate in, as you can see. I mean, it's just basic, basic gears and you just manipulate them. It's basic engineering. It's common sense if you do this. No, I don't do our marketing. Yeah, so we wanted to talk a, a bit about Hobie. Hobie makes some similar products to us, so we think they might have the infra infrastructure to create and produce a product, and we just think that that could be a great partnership for us. And then to market potential. We found some information about existing markets, kind of similar to ours, kayaking, boating, scuba diving, and if we could even get a fragment of these people, we could see at least over 2 million people interested in our product, and these three markets combined is overall over 30 billion a year. And what we thought about is uh, to give our product to uh, people, uh, famous sport bloggers, activists, make some videos about it, get people really hyped about it, and then start selling to the to our real potential customers, such as outdoor re resorts, hotels, rentals, basically anything with outdoor recreation. And from uh, our figures, we projected that we could sell like 500 products a year, uh, valuing up to 4.5 million dollars. And comparing to similar markets, we can see a growth of 15 to 20 percent a year, and this is only in the U.S. Now, um, that was pretty awesome. Now, who's ready to go explore the ocean in our kayak submarine? <laughs> there is your answer. Very good. All right. Can I take this back? Like, <laughs> <laughs> All right, please evaluate the kayak sub. He's come a long way since first presentations we did.
evil very fast. It's very expensive, and gamers rely on technology, so they always want the last console, like the last game, and like it's kind of a community. So if you if you're the only one using a console, like it doesn't work because like it's online gaming, and it's really it, the retail install is very inconvenient, so it's a frustrating market. So we'll talk to you about our ideation process. So we wanted to really narrow our focus on like three key concepts. So we chose money, convenience, and the technology cycle. So focus on money, we came up with the zero margin model where we make profit on the second hand market. Um, convenience comes in the built in recycling and installation program. So say you already have a TV, but it's not the best gaming TV out there. But you want the console, the sound system, and the games. So you'd be able to sell a, exchange the TV for a discount on your monthly price that you would pay. And we'd also help you out with the installation because I mean, with the whole entire home cinema system, it's going to be a pain to install. Technology cycles, uh, we came up with a two-year leasing plan with a one-year renewal option because technology evolves fast. The newest TV is going to be out in a year, maybe two. Maybe uh, you want to be on top of everything as it goes. So we uh, came up with one-year renewal option with an extra fee. And so we came up with two different prototype packages, one for the PS4 and one for the Xbox One. You'd get a Sony 4K Ultra HD TV, the LG wireless soundbar system, PS4, three games a year, which equals six games over the two-year period. And then for the Xbox One version, we have the Samsung 4K Ultra HD TV. Those will be interchangeable. We want to give the consumer like an illusion of uh, choice, and then uh, <laughs> you want to be able to pick what you want to get. So we have a couple different options. And then, of course, you get the three uh, newest games of the year of your choice. And we're going to pass on to Emiliano for the market potential. All right. OK, thank you, Randy. All right, so for market potential, uh, what we have is a freemium model. All right, we actually don't make money or a margin from our customers. We actually uh, make money by reselling the products to second-hand retailers. Okay, so look at the look at the prices that you would pay normally for retail price. Uh, out of the whole entire package, it would be a total of twenty-four twenty, and that's a lot of money, right? So next slide, please. So uh, we look at the market uh, potential. Over uh, in one year in the United States alone, we we sell forty million consoles. Uh, to kids and families, right? So there's a 40 million, 40, 40, 40 million market, and uh, we have a strong partnerships with manufacturers. We buy directly from Sony, Samsung, uh, for all our products, and um, we don't just buy whatever we want. We actually have pre-established agreements with like big name uh, retail, uh, second-hand retailers. Uh, around the world, and based on those figures, we know exa how much exactly we need to order. So once we know how much we are actually ordering, we we uh, negotiate discounts with uh, the manufacturers, and we pass on all the savings at cost price directly to the consumer. So um, something that would cost $100 a month, now we can actually give to the consumer for only $50. All right, so the most innovative thing in our program is actually not only just passing the, the savings directly to our customers, but the innovative building recycling and installation program. Okay, you don't have to move a finger. All you, all you have to do is, uh, I want it, I want to have it. I, you, you call for it for one, and we come, we take your old equipment, we sell it right away for you, and we give you all a whole brand new package in, install it and then you start playing. Okay, it's a two-year program, it's a two-year lease, and uh, uh, second-hand technology retailers have been growing at a 4.2 percent according to Ivor's work over the last five years, and it, it generates 20 billion in profit. Um, after the two years, the whole package they maintain their value. Okay, so what it was 2420. Now it's actually worth $890. Okay, next slide. Cash converters and cash, uh, cash generators are like huge companies uh, in Europe and they're growing. It's, a, it's an international franchise and they are in 21 countries already and they keep growing. So 
developing a strong partnerships with these two uh, retailers and the, a little distributors from Amazon and eBay, we are guaranteed to like move the product and keep the cycle going. This is a win-win situation for second-hand retailers and for us. How do we make our money? Well, we get it for cost, and we give the cost to the consumer. They pay us over the two years what the, the product is, and now we have the product back, and we have is we can actually res resell it for very small, like a hundred dollars for a, for the package, which is pretty you know you, if you do the math, it's a really good deal for the retailers for us, and it's basically full profit. So selling, uh, just doing conservative numbers of a 40 million uh, industry, we actually capture, if we capture 1% of the console market per year, and we sell it for $100, we, that, is, that means that we are making 40 million every two years. Okay, so that's a huge market potential. It's a win-win situation for customers, for us, and for the other retailers, because they need to maintain uh, a supply of high quality used products. So four in one, we provide a premium home entertainment leasing program at a low monthly price. Who is ready to lease with us? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, very nice, very nice. All right, please evaluate four and one. It's very interesting for this one. Yeah, right. I think they've got an interesting model. All right, so let's talk about the organization.
So <laughs> 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 I wonder what that is. We'll give him a bone because they put that on the phone because I think they could have been better. It was a song. 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 It How many more groups have to present after this one? <laughs> Save the best for last, right? <laughs> Presentation. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. Oh, really? Hi, everyone. So this is our project, All of Us. I'm Kathleen and Alison Connor, and we're going to present you our comps. So first of all, we're going to talk uh, so the concept, design thinking, how we came up with the idea, what were our problems. Uh, then we're going to show you a little mock-up of a possible ad that we could show. And then numbers are market potential. OK, so well, uh, my idea came from my passion, why? Uh, I love to go to wine bar and try good wines and enjoy my time there. And that's um, and wine bars have been really successful these few years. This past year, sorry. But the fact is, I am always disappointed because I found wines that I would have found in a grocery <coughs> store, and that's a big problem. I know a lot of my friends and a lot of consumers um, find that. Uh, when they go to a wine bar. Well, uh, I also um, I also know that a lot of wineries, small wineries, don't sell their product to um, grocery stores or restaurants or wine bars. They just sell their product to their winery. So if you don't go there, you will never try these wines. So with these two problems, I came to NAD. Why do not do partnership with wineries, this kind of wineries, and each month welcome a new winery in my wine bar to sell their products. So my concept, a new guest winery each month with a new wine and menu dedicated to the winery of the month, updated gourmet menu because of course if you decline you would like you would like to, to have really good food as well and I'm French so <laughs> I want really good food. And a new winery storage to educate people. But the fact is, I talked to my ID, um, to my uh, colleague, and it was not really innovative and surprising. We saw that uh, wineries were actually quite far from San Diego or other cities, and that it took a while to get to the wineries. And once you're there, well, it's pretty much the same thing. You taste the wine, you have some food, and it's basic. And so we wanted to make something really innovative and to make the wineries come to the people and not the people come to the wineries. So why not put the wine into a bus? Why not um, completely uh, destroy the bus inside and put a winery inside? Uh, a double-decker bus with underneath a sort of kitchen area and above 
a place where you could drink and appreciate your wine with a little atmosphere, some music, and yes. Um, so we looked if it was possible to do this, obviously, in America, but there's a lot of laws that um, don't allow you to drink in the streets or even uh, drink in buses. They need to move or should they not move? So that was a big problem for us, so we thought, why not put this wine bus in France? We come from France, and we can assure you that food trucks, wine buses don't actually exist, but food trucks are a very, very big trend there. There's a lot of festivals, and it has better growth in France than uh, in the United States, and it's far more trendy. And obviously wine, not to brag, French people do know their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the beginning of our design thinking. And to evaluate our idea, we went online and we look at the trends and the numbers of the market industry, the wine industry in France, the food truck industry, and yes, there is a market for sure. But we also noticed something. Most of the um, uh, food truck lovers really like food trucks because they can find original product there, uh, organic product, fresh, fresh from uh, markets, uh, etc. So we say, OK, well, we're going to answer to this need. And we're going to focus on organic wine in our booth. So we had here a photo sheet we made. Yeah, so uh, we wanted to try and keep the sort of ambiance that you find in wineries. So keep the wooden base, but try and make it a little bit more modern. So we added start chairs. And we put a little bit of uh, bottles everywhere, so there's the bus, and at the end, a more like a bigger table for big groups that want to go in the bus, and with the logo at the end. And there'll be music, a little bit of incense, maybe we close the shares and do something. And so here's our um, ad. <laughs> Welcome to Bottle Bus. We provide wine in a trendy, unique atmosphere on a traveling bus. We will bring you diverse flavors of organic wines from all over the country and a special in-house chef for providing you with a salad taste. Each month, partnering with a new winery that sells its product exclusively on-site, where they produce their wine. Coming soon to Paris, Dijon, Lyon, Montpellier. Wine Buzz, bring the wine to you. Obviously, we're not Spielberg or anything, but that that, that, that could be a mock-up. <laughs> um, so yeah, what a what a lovely commercial that was, and what a great actor. Uh, I know. <laughs> so just to touch on the market potential a bit, something we talked about earlier was there were some legal uh, things that prohibited us from doing it in America. So we decided why not go with France, where wine is actually the most consumed alcoholic beverage. Uh, most people in France consume. A glass and a half per day, so I think that's a lot, and they love their wine. Um, they produce 20% and consume 14% of the world's wine, so there's opportunity to get with distributors and get with people who are consuming. Uh, to touch on kind of the other half of what we're talking about, the food truck industry, uh, there are 40 public areas that were just uh, designated in Paris alone, obviously Paris the capital, for food truck locations, so food trucks can go there uh, and sell their food. Um, a big problem with uh, France is a lot of the buildings are old and they're trying to preserve their culture and their history in the buildings, so it's not easy to open up a new restaurant. That's why food truck, or the food truck industry is booming there. Uh, it's estimated that to open, to renovate a food truck would cost 100,000 euros, which is like 115,000 US dollars, um, with an estimated average revenue of 70,000 per year. Uh, you could make that back within two years. Um, so really the only monthly expense is gas driving around. Um, so another big part of why we wanted to do this in France was, like I said, the industry is booming and it's becoming really popular. I don't know if any of you guys watch Food Network, but a couple years ago they had the great food truck race. Uh, they went all over, I think, California uh, with food trucks and different competitions, and that is going to premiere in France this year. Uh, it's a fancy French name I can't say, so I'm not going to say it, but um, <laughs> it's going to bring a lot of uh, public eye to food trucks in France. Um, so the demand is increasing. Um, and then furthermore, there's so many apps now for finding food trucks, like uh, you guys demonstrated an example of Pop-Up Chef, but there's uh, 
Roaming Hunger, uh, Find Food Truck, their websites where you can go and find for foodies to find things. Um, so it's easily accessed. We think the market's growing, and that's why we think we have the best of both the wine industry and the food truck industry. Uh, so that concludes our presentation. Thank you guys for listening. Feel free to try our uh, wine of the month there on the way out. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Um, I think you guys did a really good idea combining two concepts. Um, I just got back from Italy and the, the wines are totally different from how people consume wine in America. Um, I'd look into the laws of drinking beverages in a vehicle because mm -hmm. they have like you can pedal and drink beer on those on those um, automobiles in the streets. So I'm looking at that again, but I think also taking a concept that might be big here and taking it somewhere else is huge. That's what companies do at times. For example, like us with blah blah car, you know, that's not really here. So taking a concept that works somewhere else and bring it here.